just to look at uh, what our transport infrastructure is like. And uh, you will see, unarguably, that over 90% of, of our transportation in Nigeria is done by road at the moment, as the uh, real program championed by our principal, President Muhammadu Buhari, and executed by the ministers for transportation and minister of state for transportation, Right Honorable Rotimi Amichi and distinguished Senator Saraki, begin to take a foothold, perhaps we will see a different mix in how much um, road transportation really takes in terms of haulage. Let me say again that in terms of what we haul by road, I think I have described this as the eighth wonder of the world. Most of what we carry on road in many other jurisdictions is moved by rail. And so I hope that that mix will come on sooner rather than later. And you begin to see corridors evolving, Lagos, Ibadan, Itakpewari, Abuja, Kanu, and uh, Abuja, Kaduna, pardon me, and the Kanu route now. Hopefully, uh, we will get there. Our road network is in the order of about 200,000 plus kilometers, subject to updating new roads that have been built at different levels of uh, government. But the federal road network is about 35,000 kilometers of that uh, 200,000 kilometers. The remainder belongs to the states and the local government. Therefore, you will see that the road transport is a major enabler in the Nigerian economy. There are some people whose livelihoods depend on being on particular roads on a daily basis. If they don't go on a road, then their family has difficulty. Uh, and so that is how critical the road network can be for, indeed, all of us. Without the roads, it would have been impossible. There is no uh, train service yet to this part of Abuja. So we still have to uh, do this. So what are we doing? I think it's important to get a sense of the government's disposition before we begin to talk about investment. Because government is the enabler. Government sets the agenda. This is where we will be busy. And that is when private sector then says, oh, if government is doing this, let me play here. I think that's how it works. So this administration set out. And let me just recap that a little bit. You know, I think it was in 2014, before this administration, we were warned that there was going to be a recession no less by the minister in charge of the economy at the time, that there will be a recession. So it did not matter who became president. This economy was going into a recession. So what mattered, or what was going to matter, was what were you going to do? What were you going to do as a way out? What the Buhari administration chose to do was to develop an economic recovery and growth plan. If you remember that plan. And one of the drivers of that plan was investment in infrastructure. At the time that the economy was going down, was predicted to go down, the capital side of Nigeria's four trillion Naira budget was 15%. The first Buhari government budget, I think, was 8 trillion, of which 30% was allocated to capital. So it was clear 
what this government want to, wanted to do, an expansionist fiscal program targeted at infrastructure. Before I go to the results, let me pause to address a conversation that has emerged, I think, a few days ago, somebody was quoted as saying that this administration cannot fix the economy by infrastructure. And I think that person uh, essentially was diving into a propeller. Because, with great respect, he is not only wrong, he is palpably wrong. And I will show why. You see, if you think back, imagine and ask yourself, have you ever heard a president, a governor, a prime minister, a local government chairman, on his inauguration day, in any inauguration speech you read or listened to, not commit to infrastructure? The reason is simple. It is the most legitimate way to distribute wealth in a society, to create economic activity. So what is the plan doing now? Our recovery plan means today we have 895 highway and bridge contracts under execution. Highway and bridge contracts, not projects. So let's be clear. 895 contracts we are managing. This is because our roads are very long. So if you look at the Kanu Maiduguri Highway, for example, it's 560 kilometers of dual carriageway. So it is difficult, really, to get one construction company to execute that. So what we do, we break them into sections. So we have five major contracts there. And this translates now to 13,552 kilometers out of 35,000 kilometers federal network. So this is what the ERGP is delivering. We have started a bridge rehabilitation program nationwide. At the moment, we have impacted 46 bridges. Some of these bridges have been built for decades without this maintenance. And that is why you find when you drive on those bridges at the expansion joints, you feel discomfort when your car runs over them. Federal Road, Federal Road Maintenance Agency, FEMA, is also undertaking scheduled maintenance. For 2021 year, the maintenance is over 5,000 kilometers scheduled for this year. Of course, in the housing area, we are also busy. Now, many of you will perhaps have seen reports of some of these projects, and I need not dwell uh, too much on them, but whether it is on the Lauren Jeba, local Weto Bridge, Gombe Numan, Yola Road, uh, the Kano Maiduguri that I've spoken about, the Abuja to Kano Highway, Kano Katsina Road leading to the uh, Kasina still rolling mill, Enugu Portacourt, the second Niger Bridge. Uh, there's a lot going on. But to the meat of the matter, how does this impact investment? Let me say that all over the world, all over the world, no country accepted. The drivers of the national economy are SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. Law firms, construction firms, uh, engineering consultancy, dentists, small, this is manufacturing, cottage businesses, and all of that. Those are the drivers of any economy. If they work, that economy works. Businesses owned by families. And this is where the rubber meets the road in construction industry. Construction companies don't keep construction equipment. They don't keep construction materials, sorry. So they have their plants, they have their machines. 
but they don't keep iron rod, they don't keep laterite, they don't keep sand, they don't keep gravel, they don't keep granite, they don't keep cement, they don't keep diesel, they don't keep lubricants. It is when government spends and say go and build road A that they start ordering them. So who are the suppliers? Bitumen companies owned by families, owned by groups of people. Quarries owned by families, owned by small businesses. And this is how investment responds to infrastructure spending. So if we take the second Niger Bridge, for example, one component there, diesel, throughout the construction period, is going to consume 19 million liters of diesel. Just pause and process that 19 million liters of diesel. So the construction company there doesn't make diesel. Somebody has to supply that diesel. So it means that a sector of Nigeria's economy that must be ready to continue to supply them. The same thing with asphalt, bitumen, uh, 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 cement, reinforcement, and so on and so forth. So this is how the interconnectivity works. But that is only one side of the Story. So you will see the need for construction materials. We need quarry, we need aggregates, we need asphalt, we need bitumen, we need laterite, we need lubricants and all of that. So these are areas for investment as long as the Nigerian government continues to invest in infrastructure. And this is not just road infrastructure. So this is a logical order of progression of building the economy through spending. And if you have doubt whether the Nigerian model will work, look at what is happening in the presidential system that we copy. I think it is undebatable that the U.S. infrastructure is much more advanced than ours. But that economy is still planning to spend $3 trillion dollars to build more. So if we want to compete, this has to continue. And as long as this continues, this is the way, really, to create work. There are areas where we can certainly do with a lot of investment, and the opportunity is ripe now. As we are building more, the demand for bitumen is increasing. And we have large deposits of bitumen in many parts of the country. So this is one area where government is seeking now to drive investment and where we have seen appetite. A few uh, companies have come to us now that look, they want to get their feet inside the water. They see the future because of the commitments that we have made. They want to start producing uh, locally. Um, of course, with bridges, uh, that we are building. Uh, Bosin referred to the uh, bridge linking us with Cameroon. There is also the Econ Bridge, the second Niger Bridge, has spoken about the need for reinforcement. So, again, if these policies continue, clearly I see the possibility of expanding our steel production and manufacturing footprint to feed that market. There is an important point I wish to make. Right now, most of the bridges we are rehabilitating, maintaining, repairing, largely require two things. The largest components, expansion joints and bearings. These are foundry work. And all of the expansion joints that we're using, all of the bearings we're using now, are fabricated outside Nigeria and brought in. That is an active area of interest where I think investors um, can play. What we want to do, we have 1,700 plus bridges nationwide. So we are trying to build an industry case, so not just a few bridges, to be able to dimension the size of joints, 
and bearings that are going to be needed uh, in addition to other components that we use to build bridges. When we finish the road, and in the process of constructing it, I've talked about diesel and all of that, there are other things which we characterize or call road furniture, lane marking, signage. These are again the businesses of small cottage industries, manufacturing, assembling, uh, producing special paints with uh, thermoplastic paints with glass beads. We are still importing some of these. And as President says, let us use what we make and make what we need. So these are again opportunities for investment. And I'm glad to say that there are a few small businesses, young people who are working with us in the ministry now, who are saying, we are tired of importing. They are setting up their small, small plants. Those are the SMEs I spoke about. As the policy gets right, those people will play. They will get their feet in. We need way bridges to protect. So we are going into the area of operation and maintenance now. After the road is built, what happens? We've just announced a tolling policy. So we are going to be building toll plazas. All of these are enormous areas of opportunity for, for investment. Of course, something has been happening since 2015. It used to happen before, but not with enough regularity. A data collection process of what is going on on our road. So every two, two years now, we do traffic data analysis. What the traffic count is on all the major federal roads. We do it every two, two years. So this year is due. This is employment. And these are set skills that we engage. Of course, those of us who are invested in this industry know that it is not just any sand, any laterite, or any diesel, or any type of product that you can mix together to go and build a road. They are set qualities. And therefore, before you apply them, they must go to a lab. We operate laboratories, in case people don't know, on every highway project, we have a lab set up. Again, these are investments for which people get rewarded, remunerated, and also employed. In the process of conceiving the idea of a road, it has to be designed. Consultants are employed. Right now, we have 168 design consultants under contract in the ministry. Then when we award the contract, we have design supervision uh, as well, construction supervision. Right now, we have 202 such contracts. So these are all small businesses taking positions, investing in the economy as a result of what we are uh, committed to. Of course, I could not overemphasize the lubricants need and how one sector, transport sector, drives other sectors. Mining, which is for quarry, petroleum, which is for lubricants, also agriculture. Because on every shift where you have workers, they need nutrition. So again, the agro sector is driven because we are playing. So every construction site that you go to today you will find one small business has taken up position there to supply food. And when I ask them at the site, how much is a plate of a bar? They say it's 250. And that is happening on every site. That doesn't belong to the ministry. So those are reactions, investments. But when you see a bowl of a bar, a goosey, and fish. Don't forget that there's also a chain reaction. That fish came from the farmer, not from the woman who bought it. So people just begin to take position as you make policy. 
and livelihoods then depend on all of this. Let me round up just by emphasizing again the importance of what happens in terms of operation and maintenance of our road corridors, which is the, the, the uh, final impact of building a road. Because building itself doesn't employ as much as operation and maintenance. That's where the real juice is. And in terms of further investments that we hope to see, we have launched the Highway Development Management Initiative. And this process seeks to concession 12 highways, totaling over 1,000 kilometers. Uh, we had 75 investors. And uh, we're shortlisting now those who have qualified to go to the next stage. And there's a lot of work also going on just as a result of this policy. Environmental, social impact assessment because of the international funding uh, mix that is coming into it. All of the governance protocols. So there's so many people playing. We expect to see many things. We expect to see an investment in the order of 1.1 trillion if it succeeds. We expect to see 50,000 direct jobs if it succeeds and up to 200,000 indirect jobs. We expect to see highways that will have uh, rest houses, that will have very well-equipped towing services. Some of the towing vehicles that you see on our roads today, they, they themselves need to be towed. But they are small businesses. So given what we are designing, we expect that bigger, more structured firms will accommodate them, they will leverage on their access to credit, change their fleet, operate under a more efficient and rewarding structure. We expect to see ambulance services under that concession, again, medical services, providing ambulance services. Those are the kind of things we expect to see. Toll operators within those consortia. And the interesting thing about it is that we have a site on the, on the portal for the HDMI that we call the vendor marketplace. And it's important to share what the vendor marketplace is here. There are people who want concessions. So there's a portal where they go for a road. There are people who want concessions of certain services, maybe a way bridge. Maybe they want advertising only on the route and all of that. They have their own concessions. But there are people who just want to provide services, whether financial, I want to run this, I want. So go and exhibit yourself there as a vendor so that people can then talk to themselves in that ecosystem and take position. The last point I wish to make, which perhaps is easy to overlook, is that as the investment in the transport sector increases and gets better, and the results begin to manifest as they are, there is one area that is going to invest and put its foot even more deeply in water, vehicle manufacturers. Trucks, minivans, private vehicles. So this is an area, again, that Nigeria is inching to play. We already see the offtake in some of our people, mini buses, luxurious buses. These are things we used to do before in Anamco and all of those places. We expect that this will come back as responses to the policy and execution of the investment in road transport sector. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. I do hope that I have kept to the time. <laughs>